Welcome back. I'm the Intense MD, a double board certified intensivist, here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. February is heart month, as I stated in last week's video, and the first condition we are going to talk about is a heart attack. This is a serious health condition and it is a medical emergency. So it is important to know the signs and symptoms and if you are at risk for a heart attack because this is a time-sensitive diagnosis. The success of treatment of a heart attack depends on the time between when the heart attack started and when the patient is able to get treated. A heart attack is also known as a myocardial infarction, and this is when a portion of the heart is not getting enough circulation. The coronary arteries are the blood vessels that supply the heart, and one or more of these can become blocked, leading to a lack of blood flow to one or more areas of the heart. This lack of blood flow can cause damage to the heart muscle in a process called ischemia, and if it goes on for a prolonged period of time, that muscle can be permanently damaged or necrotic. Coronary artery disease is caused by atherosclerosis or plaque buildup in the arteries, and this again causes a reduced amount of blood flow to the heart. Heart attacks are very common. This affects millions of people worldwide. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, heart disease, including heart attacks, are the leading cause of death throughout the world. According to the CDC, about 805,000 people had a heart attack in the United States last year. The WHO and the CDC bundle heart attacks within cardiovascular diseases. So again, this goes back to last week's video where I talked about multiple types of heart disease. So the number of people who died from heart disease in the past year is 697,000 people in the United States. This is not from heart attack alone, but heart attack does make up a large percentage, about 30% of these deaths. It's an estimated about 382,000 people have died from coronary artery disease in the past year, and one in five people die from heart disease worldwide. It's important to know the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. The common symptoms are chest pain or chest pressure. Many people say they feel like either a vice is around their chest and tightening, or they feel like an elephant is sitting on their chest, but pain feels different for everyone. This pain can radiate up the neck, up to the jaw, down the shoulder, around to the back, or stay in one place. Some patients might also say they have a lot of trouble breathing, shortness of breath, um, with this episode. There are also atypical symptoms of a heart attack, and these are important to note as well. Someone might have some heartburn or indigestion. They might feel fatigued, tired can also feel nausea or just generally not feeling well, like you might have the flu. Atypical symptoms are more likely in women than men, so it's important to know that even if you're not having the classic signs of heart attack, you are still potentially having a heart attack if you don't feel well and your chest does not feel right. Another group of people that might have atypical symptoms are diabetics, because many times severe diabetics have neuropathy, so their pain sensors are not... Women are more likely to have the atypical symptoms of a heart attack. It's also important to note that diabetics might not have some of the classic pain symptoms if they have severe neuropathy. There are multiple risk factors to heart attack, so it's important to know which risks that you have for heart attack, but it's also important to note that people can have a heart attack without any major risk factors or family history. So if you have any concern you're having a heart attack, but you hear these risk factors and you think, well, I don't fall into any of those categories, then you should still seek medical attention if you have any concerns. So first, obviously age people are more likely to have a heart attack as they get older. Men are more likely to have heart attacks than women, particularly premenopausal women. Estrogen is protective, so as women age and go through menopause, they lose that protection from estrogen. 
So if you're postmenopausal, then your risk for heart attack is increased compared to when you were premenopausal. You have a strong family history of heart attack. Anybody in your family who had a heart attack at a young age, smoking is a risk factor for many things and heart attack, cardiovascular disease are definitely not an exception. Smoking can increase your chance of heart disease and other vascular diseases. High blood pressure, hypertension, increases risk of heart attack through putting strain on the heart. As I said earlier in the video, atherosclerotic disease causes coronary artery disease and blockages, and this is from high cholesterol. So, so having high cholesterol, high lipid panel can increase risk of heart attack. Obesity is a risk factor due to an increased risk of hypertension and high cholesterol due to obesity. If you're sedentary, you don't exercise a lot, then your cardiovascular health can be at risk. And finally, diabetes, which again is a risk factor for many things, but diabetics are at risk for cardiovascular diseases due to the, due to the sugar causing damage to the blood vessels and tissue on a microscopic level. It's important to talk to your primary care doctor or cardiologist about how to mitigate your risk for heart attack. Obviously, there are some risks that we cannot control, but the things that are within our control, we should do our best to, to try to eliminate those risks to make it less likely to have heart disease. So how is a heart attack diagnosed? Well, first, if you have any symptoms or concerns that you are having a heart attack, you should call 911 or the emergency number in your country, seek medical attention immediately, go to an emergency room. One of the first things when you go to an emergency room with concern for a heart attack, somebody will take your medical history, they'll ask about your current symptoms and your past medical history, they will also take an EKG and most likely draw blood as well. The EKG is important because it will show us if you're having a heart attack known as a STEMI, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. This is a severe type of heart attack and this requires immediate attention. We have something in the hospital called door to balloon time. That is from the time the patient hits the door is found to have the STEMI and the time that they are in the cath lab getting that vessel revascularized. Just because you do not have a STEMI does not mean that you're not having a heart attack. There is something called an N-STEMI or a non-ST elevation MI. There are other signs on a EKG that can suggest the heart attack, but many times the blood work that we draw can be a good indicator that you are in fact having a heart attack. We look at a level of an enzyme called troponin. This is something that is released by the heart tissue that is damaged. So if somebody's troponin level is abnormally high and continuing to rise, then it is a concern that this person is having a heart attack. It is not as time sensitive as a STEMI, but it is still something that needs to be taken care of. So once you've been evaluated by the physician, had an EKG, had labs done, seen the cardiologist, the cardiologist will most likely take you to the cath lab to do what is called a left heart cath. This is when the cardiologist goes in through the blood vessel, usually in the wrist or the groin, up to the heart and puts dye through the heart, through the blood vessels. They're looking to see if the blood vessels are patent and open. If there is any narrowing or complete obstruction of flow, this is an indicator of coronary artery disease. In the setting of a STEMI, it is important to determine what the culprit lesion is and which blood vessel is involved so they can open it up as soon as possible. And there are, of course, settings where somebody might have such severe disease involving multiple vessels that are critical that they might need open heart surgery or coronary artery bypass graft surgery. The timing of this depends on the patient and the severity of their heart attack. If they're having a massive heart attack and the left main artery, which is the dominant vessel in the majority of people, and there are other vessels involved that are not amenable to stenting, the cardiologist will call the cardiac surgeon from the cath lab, and this person will be emergently taken to surgery. There are some times where a cardiac surgeon will evaluate the case and decide to do it in the next day or so, but there are situations where it turns into an emergency and the patient goes from ER to cath lab to OR without making it to a hospital bed. There are some medications that we give when somebody is actively having a heart attack. I'm sure you've heard of giving nitro tablets underneath the tongue. 
And many patients who have angina are given these prescription as something that they can take if they feel they are having some bit of a heart attack while they seek medical attention. This is what's called a vasodilator that dilates the blood vessel to hopefully loosen it up and allow more blood flow. Patients are also given aspirin. And if somebody is at a hospital or center that does not have a cath lab, and we do not believe that they will get to a cath lab within the 90 minutes of a STEMI, then they might receive a clot busting agent called TPA. This is a medication that will hopefully take care of any blood clots in the culprit artery and help open up blood flow to the heart. And then again, the patient most likely will also be prescribed medications that help reduce their risk factor. So if they are diabetic and their blood sugar is not within control, they might get oral medications or insulin. If they have high cholesterol, then they will receive a statin. Most people who have had a heart attack, whether they have abnormal lipid panel or not, will receive a statin. If the patient had stents placed, and this is when the cardiologist goes in, opens up the blood vessel, and places a stent to keep it open, and that is something that is done um, to revascularize the heart instead of doing open heart surgery. In order to keep that stent open and preventing a clot from forming within the stent, a patient needs to take what is called dual antiplatelet therapy. So this is usually aspirin and another medication that helps prevent platelets from forming, that prevent platelets from forming a blood clot in the blood vessel, particularly within the stent. In the cath lab, once the cardiologist sees which portion of the vasculature is affected, they may place a stent. This is a process that involves ballooning open the vessel and then placing a stent or a metallic device that keeps that area open and helps restore blood flow to the affected part of the heart. A heart attack is a medical emergency. Again, this is something that requires immediate medical attention because the patient's outcome does depend on how quickly blood flow is restored to the heart. If the heart tissue goes a long time without appropriate oxygen and nutrients, that part of the heart can have necrosis and no longer function. So even if a stent is placed or a bypass graft is placed, if that part of the heart muscle is already severely damaged, then restoring flow will not bring it back. Sometimes the damage can be permanent. It's important to know what risk factors you have and which ones are within your control. Of course, talking to your primary care doctor or cardiologist about any lifestyle risk that can be reduced. If you have any questions about heart attacks, myocardial infarction, please let me know below. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe if you want to learn more about heart health this month and ICU medicine in the upcoming months, and I'll see you in the next video.